Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera where today's video is going to be just what it says in the title of the video. Uh, it's going to be a comparison between the Canon 7 and Nikon SP rangefinder cameras or maybe the Nikon SP versus the Canon 7. I haven't actually written the title of the video yet because of course uh, obviously I'm still making the video but will be one of those two. Uh, the reason I'm making this video, well, actually, I have a couple of reasons. First, uh, I just happen to have two of, you know, one of these, a pair of cameras, one of each, which isn't often the case, though I often have a, a Canon 7 uh, available and listed for sale in my stores. I don't often have the Nikon SP. Uh, these are a little bit harder to come by in decent condition and uh, significantly more expensive. So I don't often have one of these. I got this camera for uh, my personal use and I haven't decided uh, uh, yet whether I'm going to sell it or not. But since I have these two cameras, I decide while I have them at the same time, I would go ahead and do a comparison between the two. These were the top of the line rangefinder cameras produced in Japan in uh, the early 1960s. And though they are both uh, rangefinder cameras, they both are silver and black, uh, and they both feature interchangeable lenses and adjustable frame lines for the viewfinders, which I'll, I'll go into later. Uh, there are that, that's kind of where the similar similarities end, and Nikon and Canon kind of took very different approaches when it came to the manufacture of their high-end rangefinder cameras. Uh, the Canon 7 was the last of the M39 mount interchangeable lens rangefinder cameras. Uh, it was introduced in 1961 and was produced until 1964. This is the most common variation. This is the first variation and the one you are most likely to see if you do a search on the Canon 7. Uh, this camera was uh, improved with the Canon 7S and what they did is they got rid of the selenium light meter and they installed a CDS light meter which was battery powered. And then the final variation and the hardest to find is the Canon 7SZ or Z depending on how you prefer to pronounce that last letter. And that was basically the Canon 7S but with the uh, rangefinder adjusting uh, access port moved from here by the shutter speed dial to directly above uh, the viewfinder which made it a little bit easier to make that adjustment. Uh, on the other hand here, the Nikon SP was introduced earlier, uh, back in 1957, and it was produced also until 1964. And it features the Contax mount, uh, rather than the, the Leica M39 mount. When Canon began producing the rangefinder cameras in the 1940s, they were basically a copy of the old Leica uh, screw mount rangefinder cameras, which was pretty much what most of the uh, Japanese manufacturers did. Uh, at the end of the war, Japan and Germany lost all the patents on their cameras and things like that, and that allowed anyone to manufacture uh, anything, you know, cameras according to their design. And a lot of the uh, Japanese cameras, uh, Leica copies, were very good copies, and some were so close that you could interchange parts between, you know, the German-made Leica cameras and the Japanese-made cameras, like uh, Leotax, Minolta, early Yashikas, Nikas, things like that. Uh, Canon kind of differentiated themselves between the, the Leica uh, design a little bit and they did that by basically putting this kind of boxed and I don't know a diamond edge diamond edges or you know these angled edges on the camera instead of being round like the Leica cameras but uh, the earlier Canons of course you know, through the 1950s the internal parts were basically uh, copies of the Leica system uh, Nikon, on the other hand, they decided to copy the contacts design. There are a lot of people who thought that the contacts design was more aesthetically pleasing and a little bit more technically, technically sophisticated because it used this uh, focusing wheel system, uh, which you could uh, operate with the finger and not actually have to touch the lens. Uh, the interesting thing about the, the Nikon SP or a lot of the other Nikon rangefinder cameras is that with practice you can operate them uh, pretty much with one hand. You can focus them, you can set the uh, shutter speed, and you can even turn the aperture ring. Uh, so I guess if you're a one-handed person it's a pretty good uh, camera to have. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can you, you can just see the difference in I guess the the philosophy between the two companies. Uh, both are very well made cameras and uh, yeah, yeah, I just love them. Uh, both of the cameras I love very much. Uh, there weren't so many variations with the Nikon SP. When it was invented it pretty much uh, you know, it, it kept its uh, original design from the time it was released till the time that uh, 
manufacturing ended. Uh, the only improvement which was made to the camera was with the shutter curtains and uh, Nikon added titanium shutter curtains uh, later in production. The early production cameras featured rubberized silk curtains. So. What I'm going to go ahead and do now is kind of uh, describe these cameras one at a time and I'm going to start with the Canon 7 over here on the left and uh, basically uh, it, as you can see it's a, an attractive camera and a very well thought out design and by the late 1950s and early 1960s uh, manufacturing had reached a, a very high level in Japan and access to materials had greatly improved and Japan was able to manufacture very high quality glass which was a, something which was difficult before. Uh, in the post-war era uh, quality glass was really hard to come by and uh, Japan ended up importing a lot of its optical glass from America and uh, when they finally were able to manufacture their own glass they actually did quite a good job and the reviews of the, the lenses in the 1950s and 60s were quite good and many of these were uh, you know, comparable or sometimes people said superior to the lenses which were manufactured by Leica. Uh, the top of the camera here, the layout is very simple. We have the film rewind dial and uh, the first version Canon 7 has this smaller dial. The later versions feature, or excuse me, a rewind knob. The larger ones featured a, later ones featured a larger rewind knob which made it a little bit easier to rewind the film. Uh, here you have the frame selector dial and we have a selection of frames here from 35 millimeter, uh, 50 millimeter, uh, to the 85 and 100 millimeter and when you do this selection here you'll see uh, two different sets of frame lines inside and then finally the 135 millimeter uh, lens and these were the most popular lenses which Canon sold in those days. Uh, they made uh, two wider lenses, they made a uh, 28 millimeter lens as well as a 25 millimeter lens. To use those lenses you needed an accessory viewfinder uh, but looking at the top of the camera you can see there isn't a place to clip on the viewfinder so if you want to use one of these lenses you need an adapter which uh, plugs into the uh, flash sync socket here and comes up over the top of the camera and allows you to put the viewfinder on the top. That's a little bit awkward and it kind of blocks out the light meter. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what the, the logic Canon had behind this system when they brought it out, but uh, it was what was used on some of the earlier uh, cameras. Uh, of course, the earlier ones used a regular shoe on the top for mounting a flash, very conventional, but Canon needed the space for their built-in light meter. Uh, this here is a readout for the, the light meter itself, and we have a couple of sets of uh, numbers. One set is in uh, white, and one set is in uh, what they call, uh, I guess, international orange, uh, the same color paint which they put on light towers and things like that, so airplanes don't hit them, so it's highly visible. And uh, what you do, uh, the, the, the difference between the numbers depends on the amount of light you have and how you have the light meter set. For outdoor shooting, there's a uh, you, you would use the standard setting, and that's with the black dot on the top of this switch on the back. And for low light shooting, you turn it so uh, the international orange uh, dot is pointing upward, and that increases the sensitivity of the light meter. And if you're using the, of course, the orange setting, you use the orange numbers. If you're using the standard setting, you would use the white numbers. Next to that we have uh, the shutter speed dial with the full range of uh, speeds uh, from T and bulb and one second all the way up to one thousandth of a second. And uh, we have a couple of windows here. These are where you uh, see the, or check or set uh, all three of those things. Uh, the film speed. And to set the film speed you have to push in on this button here. And this allows you to turn the dial and you'll, the, dial, the shutter speed dial will change. But the film speed uh, numbers will remain steady and you can adjust upward or downward. A uh, very simple system and uh, quite easy to use. Over here to the the front uh, top right, if you're from if you're looking behind the camera, is the access uh, port for the rangefinder, and this is for the vertical adjustment. This is incredibly hard to reach. Uh, at first, it's difficult to get this cap off because the tool tends to bump into the button here, and then the uh, alignment screw isn't exactly underneath of this access port. It's a little bit downward into the back, and you really kind of have to play with it. And just turning a little bit makes kind of a huge difference in the adjustment. It's a 
really difficult to uh, change it and that's why eventually in the final variation they moved the adjustment over here and rather than using uh, the, the adjustment to the angle of the mirror what they used was a, a prism system similar to what came on the Canon P and earlier cameras but uh, put inside the camera rather than on the outside. Uh, here we have uh, the selector lever which allows you to uh, unlock the winding mechanism to rewind the film and when you're operating the camera just switch it back up to the A setting. Uh, the red setting is a lock button which locks the uh, shutter button so you don't fire it accidentally. Uh, we have a uh, film charge indicator window here which is convenient as well as the film counter window on the front. Uh, we have the viewfinder window on the back and one thing which I like about the Canon 7 is it's quite large and it's quite easy to uh, see through the viewfinder. You don't have to have your eye up too close to it. Uh, and of course the, the viewfinder in this camera is very high quality. It's made of uh, solid blocks of glass which are glued together with uh, 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 the beam splitting reflector uh, bonded in between the glass blocks. It's very solid and very optically efficient and doesn't lose a lot of light. It, it's a very wonderful system and um, you know, uh, that's one of the great things about this particular camera. The Canon P has a similar system but not as good as on the Canon C. Uh, oddly, the Canon P uh, nowadays gets a, a kind of a premium over the Canon 7. The Canon P is a, a fair amount more expensive and seems to be uh, climbing in value uh, almost every month, while the Canon 7 remains quite a good value. And uh, personally, I think the Canon 7 is a superior camera, but a lot of people just like the cleaner design of the Canon P. Uh, on the front here, this uh, is where the selenium cell sits for the light meter. Uh, this thing here in the middle, this is what uh, diffuses the light for the frame lines in the viewfinder, and then of course the viewfinder itself. Then we have the uh, access uh, cover, which covers the uh, horizontal adjustment for the range finder. And unlike the vertical adjustment, the horizontal adjustment is very, very simple to set. Uh, it, it, there's no trouble at all. It, it, you take off the cap and the screw is right there and when you're done setting make sure to put the, the cap screw back on. Be careful not to lose these. They're very easily lost and very hard to replace if you lose them. Uh, of course here we have the self timer lever, uh, the bottom of the camera, quarter inch tripod socket, and then kind of a, a sophisticated way to uh, open the film door. There's a locking lever here plus a release lever. A couple of extra, a couple of steps you have to go through to work it. And pretty much that's the inside of the camera. This one's pretty nice. This one doesn't have any uh, wrinkles on the shutter curtains, which is uh, kind of a, a big uh, big deal. These uh, shutter curtains are made out of uh, black anodized stainless steel, uh, whereas the Nikon ones that on this particular camera I have are uh, uh, silk, but the later ones are titanium. These are very durable. Usually these are dented or they have marks or wrinkles or whatever in them. It doesn't make any difference. The camera works perfectly fine either way. Uh, moving over to the uh, Nikon SP, it's a smaller camera. Uh, you can probably see it's it's not as tall, uh, it's not as deep, it's not as wide. It's a more compact camera, maybe a little bit easier to carry. Uh, it's a little bit lighter. Uh, there, you know, the, Of course, this camera doesn't have the light meter system located in the top, and without the light meter, uh, this camera would be uh, a little bit smaller and more compact. Uh, this camera was, you know, the original Nikon S rangefinder camera was kind of a, I, I don't know, uh, not exactly the most wonderful camera. It had a very tiny viewfinder and rangefinder system, not even as good as the old 1930s contacts. Uh, but the lenses were very high quality, and it was kind of the lenses which made this camera popular. And it increased in popularity enough that uh, Nikon built on the foundation of this kind of odd camera and made it into a very high quality uh, rangefinder camera. And the quality was high enough that this uh, uh, the SP S3 eventually became the foundation for the Nikon F. And uh, some of the some of the parts on this camera will interchange with the Nikon F. Uh, the film counter, the shutter speed dial, uh, the shutter button assembly, and even the, the winding lever can all be interchanged on the Nikon F. And also the shutter curtains uh, can be replaced with the Nikon F curtains. Uh, the Nikon F came, of course, with the titanium shutter curtains. And if you have an old Nikon uh, SP or rangefinder camera with the silk curtains, which are you know, damaged or stiff or whatever, uh, uh, a quality camera repair shop can convert uh, your camera to the titanium uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, shutter curtains by you know by just salvaging them from an old Nikon F, and those are pretty common and easy to find, and and in non-working or bad condition, are quite cheap. 
Nikon SPs, on the other hand, are not cheap. Uh, they're quite expensive and um, usually about three times, sometimes more, uh, the cost of the Canon 7. Uh, the Canon 7, I, I've done a couple of videos on the black paint versions. Those are probably the rarest of them. More, Those are more rare than the Canon 7 SZ, uh, though some people claim otherwise. Uh, I do see more of the SZ cameras on the market than I do the original black paint ones. Uh, the Nikon SP was also available in the black paint finish and there was also a special um, Olympic version of the SP made that was the final variation which was made in 1964 <clears throat> Nikon made a black paint uh, S3 which was their Olympic version and their Olympic version for the SP was a silver camera But it came with the same 50 millimeter f 1.4 lens Which was a more advanced design or maybe not more advanced But at least a different design than the 5 centimeter f 1.4 lens which was the, the more common common. Looking at the top of this camera, uh, I, I pointed out the, the viewfinder adjusting ring on the Canon 7 and here it is located on the Nikon SP. And the first thing I notice is that this works much more smoothly. Uh, it takes a little bit more effort but there are detents for each setting and they are color coded. We have four settings on here, 5, 85, uh, 105, and of course uh, 135. And as you turn these, uh, there are frame lines uh, added or removed from inside the viewfinder and they're color coded. So uh, the, the Canon camera has numbers. When you select, for example, if I switch to 35, it'll show the 35 millimeter frame line. It'll say 35 on the bottom and it, the numbers will change along with the frame lines as I turn this dial. Uh, the Nikon viewfinder, in order to keep things smaller and more compact, they didn't do that. They just simply color-coded the uh, frame lines. And we have, as I said, a, a, a system from uh, 50 millimeter or 5 centimeter up to 135. But one thing which is very different about the Nikon SP compared to uh, any other of these old rangefinder cameras is that it has two viewfinders in it. We can see the large viewfinder window here under my finger and if I over here on this side we have a really small uh, accessory viewfinder and you you can see that uh, if you look through the smaller window here we have this wide rectangular viewfinder eyepiece on the back and there's a larger window and a smaller window. Uh, the larger window is for uh, the main lenses from 5 centimeter through 135 millimeter and the smaller one is for the uh, you know, 20, 28 millimeter and 35 millimeter lenses. So this camera doesn't require an accessory viewfinder for uh, those wider lenses. Uh, when I first got one of these cameras, uh, when I knew very little about these, I, I, I got an old beat up one which was fitted with the 28 millimeter lens and I assumed I would need to get um, a 28 millimeter viewfinder for it to be able to use that lens. And so I asked the guy at the camera shop if he had one. He said, no, you don't need an accessory finder. Just look through here. So uh, there are a couple of uh, differences between these viewfinders. The main one has parallax correction and uh, and is adjustable where the other one, the, the frame lines are fixed. So you kind of have to move the camera a little bit so uh, to, to make sure that you have the images composed correctly. But uh, yeah, it, it's an interest, interesting system. And if you get one of these cameras which has a very clean viewfinder, uh, they're really wonderful, bright and easy to use. And they have a really good focusing patch. Now, uh, unlike the Canon, the, the Nikon has a very simple uh, system here. It has a shoe, uh, a, a conventional shoe right on the top of the camera, which makes it very easy to mount a flash. We have a contact here in the middle, so you can use a flash adapter, uh, which Nikon you know, made for their pro-level cameras. And uh, this allows you to uh, use the flash adapter and use this as kind of like a hot shoe. Otherwise, there's a flash sink uh, located here on the on this side, so you can use uh, other types of flashes. Uh, of course, here we have uh, the shutter speed dial, which is the you know, the same dial, as I said, which comes on the Nikon F. Uh, this camera is available with an accessory light meter, which you would clip on the top and would, which would engage with the shutter speed dial. And that way it allowed you to have a, 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 a coupled selenium light meter, which worked quite well. Uh, unfortunately, these uh, meters are few and far between nowadays, and the working ones are quite rare and the ones you know, and very expensive. The ones which don't work are fairly reasonable, but you know if, if they don't work, that's uh, obviously they're going to be inexpensive. Who needs one which doesn't work? And unless you're just using this as kind of a, a paperweight or display item, which some people actually do. Uh, over here, we have the shutter release button, and we have the collar for uh, 
the release, which is very similar, an I, similar idea to what came on the Canon. An A system for operating the camera and R for releasing the mechanism. And here we have the film counter uh, window, and we have a selector switch here, which uh, moved from uh, 20 to 36 to let you know uh, uh, how many or what kind of film you have loaded, if it's a you know, 24 exposure or 36 exposure. On the front here, we have the focusing wheel, and it has a safety catch, which you depress. That way it doesn't move out of, you know, you can't pull it out of focus uh, accidentally. You touch this, and you can focus the camera. Uh, if you don't, if it's locked, you aren't able to focus it. It's kind of a sticking point for some people. And some of these old cameras, uh, which were used by pros back in the days, they disabled the, this feature so, it, so people would be able to focus it all the time. You can also pull up here to disable uh, the feature. And you happen to be using uh, you know, some of the other lenses, which uh, you know, some of them fit on the inside of the, the focusing mount and others mount around the outside, depending on the lens. Uh, moving to the back, nothing here other than the viewfinder window. We have the, the quarter-inch tripod socket, which is located more to the center, which I think is more convenient than what they have with the one on the uh, uh, Canon. And here we have the film speed setting reminder. So you can use, uh, say, for color or for black and white, red or black, and you would simply set this to remind you uh, what a film you have loaded in the camera. This doesn't have any effect on the operation of the camera. If you set it wrong, it's not going to have any difference. It's just a visual reminder. Uh, on the front, we have a self-timer, pretty much exactly the same as uh, the Canon uh, 7. The difference is that uh, this one here has a release button here on the front of the camera, whereas on the Canon camera, you simply depress the shutter release button uh, to fire the shutter. Uh, the self-timers on these SL, or, you know, the larger cameras, SLR and rangefinder cameras are quite reliable, so I don't worry much about using those. Uh, I always recommend that you don't use these on the, the leaf shutter uh, rangefinder cameras or on TLR cameras because they are fragile, but they are very much more durable on these cameras here. Uh, mounting the lens on this camera, you have to depress the lever here and turn it clockwise. It pops off like so. As I said, this is a this camera is based somewhat on the contacts design, and it will uh, mount contacts lenses off the old contacts um, uh, cameras. Uh, however, the spacing on the lenses is a little bit different. So, uh, if you're using the 50 millimeter or faster lenses, it's not going to focus so accurately. You can shim the lens to make it um, the proper distance on the Nikon camera. Uh, if you're using the 35 millimeter or wider lenses, those have enough depth of field that you won't notice uh, or shouldn't notice a difference in the focusing. Uh, this lens fits on the inside of the mount like so, and you turn it leftwards to lock it. Uh, the other lenses mount on these kind of bayonet lugs on the outside, the wider angle lenses and some of the telephoto lenses. Uh, that allows the lens to sit closer to the film on the inside. Uh, a variety of lenses were made for uh, the Nikons. The widest one which was available was the 2.1 centimeter uh, lens or 21 millimeter lens with the accessory finder which went on the top. Uh, these, have been, uh, come, these have become very expensive recently. Uh, they're very rare and hard to come by. Uh, I had one years ago which I paid about $700 before and I'd be lucky to get it for 10 times that price today. Uh, the next lens would be the 25 millimeter lens, and then of course the 28 millimeter lens, 35 millimeter lens, the 5 centimeter and 50 millimeter lenses, and then of course the longer lenses. And also there were super telephoto lenses made for these cameras, if you can believe it, but um, uh, those were used, of course, uh, with uh, uh, kind of a, you couldn't really use the rangefinder so much on the super telephoto lenses, but you know, uh, but they did make them, which is kind of a, a crazy thing. Uh, you're kind of limited to the contacts and uh, Nikon uh, S-mount uh, lenses if you have one of these cameras. Uh, Voigtlander did make a few lenses in this mount, but uh, not so many. But still, uh, these Nikon lenses, the 50mm lenses in particular, are fairly uh, common and not expensive. You can get one of these lenses for about... Yeah, two hundred and fifty dollars, maybe three hundred dollars, about the same price as uh, uh, a clean fifty millimeter f one point four lens. Uh, unlike the Nikon Canon lenses, none of the lenses in the Nikon system have the issue with uh, haze or uh, you know the permanent haze in the lens. Uh, Nikon's glass was probably the best which you could get in the late 1950s and early 1960s, and that's one of the reasons that their lenses were the most highly rated. 
Uh, Canon's lenses, of course, you can use pretty much anything uh, which comes in the M39 mounts, and those were made by Leica, Canon, Minolta, uh, a large variety of makers in Europe, Japan, and even America, uh, as well as a lot of the newer lenses by uh, Voigtlander, Carl Zeiss, or whatever. So this camera offers you more lens options. Uh, between the two, it's really hard. Uh, personally, uh, yeah, I, I like I kind of like this the, the, the Canon 7 because I do like the built-in light meter, and I think that the larger viewfinder is easier to use. But the, the style of the Nikon SP is really hard to beat. It has a really unique uh, appearance to it, and both cameras are uh, quite smooth and easy to use. Uh, I think that the Nikon system is a little bit smoother. It depends, of course, on the condition of the camera. Uh, I forgot that I have film loaded in this one, so I shouldn't actually be uh, dry firing. I'm not actually dry firing. I'm actually taking pictures as I'm playing with it here. But uh, yeah, one thing which I do like about uh, the Canon 7 is the wider variety of the easier to find lenses, and also that you can mount that really wild 50 millimeter uh, F095 lens, and that's what this bayonet lens mount is for for that one specific lens all of these canon cameras came with this mount despite the fact that they didn't make very many of those lenses uh, the fastest lens which came in the the nikon mount was the 50 millimeter f 1.1 lens which is a very beautiful lens and uh, comparable in price to a good example of the canon 50095 uh, which camera is the best for you? Uh, the best overall value is the Canon 7 because these are much more common and less expensive. Uh, on the other hand, the Nikon SP is more collectible and this you know, seems to be appreciating in value more quickly. Uh, there is the final version of this camera which was made in 2005, which was known as the, uh, I guess, the, the Nikon SP Limited. And Nikon actually didn't have any tooling when they decided to go crazy and actually reproduce this camera. So they went and they bought used Nikon SPs at some of the shops in Tokyo. And then they reversed engineered them. And I, I had one of these cameras, uh, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And uh, I had it and then uh, like, like so often, uh, someone made me a good offer on it and I let it go. And I kind of regret it because now they, they're going for about three times what they went for five or six years ago. The, back then you could get a, an SP limited kit for maybe $2,500 and now they're upwards of $6,000. And if there are you know, interesting serial numbers which uh, you know, appeal to certain nationalities, those make the, the prices even higher. There's no such thing with uh, the Canon 7. It remains a very uh, good value, somewhat inexpensive, probably the, the cheapest of the professional quality rangefinder cameras of this era that you'll find whereas the SP tends to be the most expensive, uh, despite the fact that they are quite similar cameras. But anyway, uh, uh, this video is getting to be a lot longer than I expected, and my battery seems to be getting a little bit low in my uh, my camera here, so I don't want to can, you know, have it shut off before I'm finished. So I'm going to go ahead and wind up the, uh, the video here. I, I have this Canon 7 uh, listed for sale in my uh, uh, Etsy store right now, and as you can see, it's quite a beautiful camera, uh, very clean looking with a very nice lens. Uh, this camera is not li listed. Um, uh, I am shooting it uh, over this season, and uh, you know, I'll probably go ahead and list it in a few months uh, when I decide to go and uh, start shooting with something else. So uh, this one's available now. This one will be available one of these days. Uh, if you're interested in a classic Japanese vintage camera, please visit one of my stores. I post links to my stores in the description below the video. Uh, if you like this video, please click the like button. And if you want to subscribe and see more videos about uh, cameras like this, please do so. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.